Welcome back to The Apologist Bookshelf. Gary Zacharias here. I want to take a look at a book that, uh, for some reason, I haven't covered before. Wow, I don't know why, because this one has sold over a million copies. Uh, the title is Know Why You Believe, and this is a newer edition that uh, got revised and updated. Let me see what the year of this one is. Uh, 2000. Okay, so originally, good land, I think it came out in the 60s. But it's been updated, and uh, Paul Little wrote also How to Give Away Your Faith. Uh, he's written, he was a staff worker for InterVarsity. Uh, he had another book called Know Why You Believe and Know What You Believe. So the what you believe covers sort of the theology of the Christian faith, while this one, Know Why You Believe, is an apologetics-oriented book. So let me just give you real quickly the Chapters, so you know what's going on with this. Um, is Christianity rational? Is there a God? Is Christ God? Did Christ rise from the dead? Is the Bible God's word? Are the Bible documents reliable? Does archaeology verify scripture? Are miracles possible? Does science and scripture agree? Why does God allow suffering and evil? Does Christianity differ from other world religions? Is Christian experience valid? And then there are questions, uh, study questions that you can go through if you want to do this book with a class. And then some notes at the end to tell you where he got all of his information. So I recommend this book. It's it's not in depth. It's not super deep, but it's got such, it, it covers the important things. And it's got such good things to say. J.P. Moreland, one of my favorite uh, philosophers, thinkers, uh, apologists, writers, he said right after his conversion in 1968, he was given a copy of Know Why You Believe. And he said that sparked his own lifelong interest in the Christian apologetics. And I'll tell you, anybody who can spark J.P. Moreland and cause him to move ahead and do the things he's done is okay in my book. He said, through the years, its quality has been demonstrated by its longevity. This is now in this updated and expanded version. Paul Little's book can continue to provide hope and help to a new generation of truth seekers. So good for uh, Moreland. I'm glad he backs this up. Billy Graham gave it a thumbs up. Uh, so again, the author is Paul Little. Let me take a look at chapter 8. And this is uh, titled, Are Miracles Possible? He starts with things that would make a lot of Christians squirm. Do you really believe Jonah was swallowed by a whale? Do you, do you seriously think Christ fed 5,000 people with just five loaves of bread and a couple of fish? He said, we get a lot of these questions these days. It's the miracle stories. He said, you know, a lot of people are saying these are just quaint ways of conveying spiritual truth. We're not supposed to take them literally. But he said, uh, if we're going to establish the credibility of one miracle, he said, that doesn't get to the root of the problem. To say, well, wait a minute. Let's take the Jonah and the whale story. So what Little is saying is, okay, suppose we could find that large fish are capable of swallowing people and have done it in the past and, and people have survived. He says, okay, but... He wants to deal not with just a single miracle. He said the puzzle is the whole possibility of miracles. So he starts with, I think, the key place to begin. He calls it our concept of God. So he said if we assume that there is a God and we assume some of the things that we know about God, miracles are no longer a, po uh, a problem. He said God is by definition all-powerful. He said if you don't have a God like that, then all of a sudden you've got miracles uh, becoming a difficult situation, maybe impossible to entertain. And uh, he said, he tells a story here, Paul Little does. He said one day he was talking about the deity of Christ with a Japanese friend, a professor, who said, I find it very difficult to believe that a man could become God. And so Little said, yes, he said, so do I, but I can believe that God could become a man. So God becoming man. So it's the idea of a big God, loving God, all-powerful God, can do these things. So next section is, is God bound by natural law? Okay, so what's he talking about here? He said, so now we get back to, does an all-powerful God who created the universe exist? If so, we should deal pretty well with miracles. Uh, and if so, he transcends the natural law. Okay, so he transcends it. God is transcendent. He's outside. He's over and he's above natural law. He's not bound by it. Little then takes on the question, so what is a miracle? He said miracles, at least the ones we get uh, recorded in the Bible and look at, 
it's an act of God. So that's not the way we use it in common speech. We talk about miracles in such cheesy th terms. You know, well, it's a miracle that I passed that test. But he said the Bible miracles are acts of God. That's a different sense. He said the Bible has different kinds of miracles. Some could have a natural explanation. So here's an example. The account in Exodus 40, 14, talking about God parting the Red Sea. Some have conjectured that maybe high winds and the water wasn't that deep. And said that, that could have happened, but it's the timing that's miraculous. The high winds would have to have come just when the Israelites reached the shore as the Egyptians began to come after them. And then after every Israelite was across, the wind would have to die down and stop the Egyptians from following. So it's the timing. He said, on the other hand, you have some miracles, there's just no natural explanation. And he gives an example, and this is the one that our pastor just talked about last Sunday. That's the resurrection of Lazarus. You can't use natural law and figure that one out. It's unknown to us. It's outside natural law. He says the same thing you could apply to Jesus' healings. He said, well, some people will say, well, psychosomatic. You know, some of those healings, uh, Jesus kind of made them think that they could get healed, and it was in their minds anyway. But he says, no, the healings of Jesus were outside this category. He gives an example of the healings of leprosy. That was not psychosomatic. That was a bacterial invasion of the body. He said the ones who were healed experienced a real power coming from God. So he said, miracles are not in conflict with any natural law. Uh, he quotes a professor who says, miracles are unusual events caused by God. The laws of nature are generalizations about ordinary events caused by him. So I think that's a good way to think about it. It says, uh, biblical miracles are an act of creation, showing God's supernatural power. You know what I always think of, and he doesn't mention this in the book here, but People say, well, isn't God violating natural law? Well, imagine that you have a, um, let's just say a baseball, and you drop it from one hand, but you catch it in your other hand before it hits the ground. Now, did you violate gravity by grabbing it and preventing it from hitting the ground? Did you violate gravity? No, you didn't. You didn't violate that law. You interceded, you interrupted, you intervened, whatever word you want to use, but gravity still worked. If you'd let your other hand loose, that ball would have continued and gone on to the floor. Now, he looks at biblical miracles next. He said, you know, the miracles that you see in the Bible are not capricious or fantastic just to make people go, gosh, wow. He said they're very different than miracle stories in pagan literature and those in other religions. He says, you'll notice, too, that they're not all over the place, just kind of randomly in the Bible. They cluster around three parts of Bible history, the Exodus with Moses, the prophets who led Israel, and the time of Christ in the early church. And he said over and over, as you look at those miracles, they always had one purpose. They were not to wow the, the people there. They were to confirm faith. They authenticated the message and the messenger, or they demonstrated God's love. They, they would relieve suffering. They, they were not entertaining. It was not like a magician. They're not done for personal prestige or to gain money or to gain power. Absolutely not. Um, people often say this. So here's his next section. Well, hey, if God performed miracles then, why does he do them now? If I just saw a miracle, I could believe. Well, Jesus answered that question himself. He tells us about that rich man who's in hell, and he pleads for Abraham to warn his brothers. And the, he's told that the brothers had the scripture, but the rich man protested, well, if somebody would rise from the dead, they'd be shaken by that miracle. But what's the response? If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. That's Luke sixteen thirty one. Isn't that a powerful statement when you really think about it? And I think that's so true. I think today if some uh, something, if God was to write up in the sky, I love you, sign God, People would look for any kind of explanation except God. They would start with CAT scans to see what's wrong with them, or they'd look at wind currents or do something, but they would reject it as much as uh, you encounter it in that story in Luke. All right, uh, what about this one? Reliable records verify the miracles. It said miracles aren't necessary for us today as a basis of faith. Uh, we have 
extraordinary records of superior accuracy to show us God's truth. So uh, it says miracles of Jesus were done in public. Right? So it's reliable there. It's it's not something that you don't encounter in the in the open. They they were in the open. The miracles were done in public, not in secret. They're done before unbelievers. And the miracles were carried out through three years of ministry. All sorts of powers. Showed the power of nature. Jesus had power over disease, over demons. Jesus had supernatural knowledge. He knew Nathaniel was under a fig tree. He could create. He fed all those people from a few loaves and fishes. Uh, power over natural forces. He calmed the wind and the waves. And, of course, he raised Lazarus. And the testimony of the cured is undeniable. Uh, we have it from people like Lazarus. That was not psychosomatic. And then compared to non-Christian religions, these New Testament accounts of Jesus are extraordinarily unique. It's a completely different category. Miracles in other religions, he says, uh, are usually believed because the religion is already believed. But for the Bible, the miracles were done as a way to establish the true religion. Israel was brought into existence by a series of miracles. Many of the prophets were identified as God's spokesmen by their power to perform miracles. And Jesus came not only preaching, but he performed miracles. And even the apostles worked wonders. It was the miracle all the way through that was authenticating the religion, saying, this is real. These are our credentials. This, is, this proves it. And C.S. Lewis wrote this. I think this is a good comment that he has from Lewis here. All the essentials of Hinduism would, I think, remain unimpaired if you subtracted the miraculous, and the same is almost true of Islam. But you can't do that to Christianity. Lewis says it's precisely the story of a great miracle. A naturalistic Christianity leaves out all that is specifically Christian. Good point. Then he brings up, little brings up uh, pagan miracles. He said, yeah, there are miracles recorded outside the Bible, but they differ in order and in dignity and, and motive compared to those in Scripture. But the authentication that you get in the biblical miracles is missing. You just don't, you can't back it up. You can't check it out and see about that. Um, he says, now, you find some miracles are counterfeit, but that's no proof they're all spurious any more than you discovered some counterfeit currency. would say all currency was spurious. It says you have to compare all of them. It says some attempts have been made to explain away miracles, on the basis of maybe exaggerated reporting. Maybe these guys are just, their followers of Jesus got all fired up about that. And he says, yeah, it's true. People are notoriously inaccurate in reporting events. He said, all you have to do is play that game Rumor, or whatever it's called, where you have people sitting in a circle and you whisper from person to person. So it says, well, so you can't really trust any person. Uh, so we should discount the gospel accounts, right? They're just mistaken. They said, but our law courts don't cease to function. Eyewitnesses are still considered able to provide useful information. I mean, you may have different reports from people, uh, but so the, if you had an auto accident, for example, you're never going to say, well, it didn't happen because the witnesses differ in exact details. By the way, again, I'm adding my own comments here, but J. Warner Wallace, a uh, cold case detective, said, it's those slight differences as he read the gospel stories that made him believe that this was eyewitness reporting. Because if you're cooking something up, everybody says the exact same thing. So I think that's interesting. He says, um, what about this, though? Miracle stories have to be discarded because they're told by believers, disciples, so they're not objective. And J. Warner Wallace also deals with this. Okay, but he says the disciples were the ones on the scene who saw the miracles. Uh, if they're disciples, that doesn't really matter. The question is, did they tell the truth? Eyewitness testimony is the best we can get. And most of the disciples faced death as a test of their veracity. So the crucial question is not, well, what are your beliefs? But it's how truthful uh, was the testimony. And then toward the end of the chapter, he says, the question is philosophical. When people invoke science, he says, okay, but science cannot forbid miracles. Natural laws do not cause and cannot forbid anything. They just describe what happens, what normally happens. The possibility of seeing something as a miracle depends on our presuppositions. Do we think miracles are possible? What's the presupposition of the Christian? God exists. He's originated natural law. He can make it or break it. He can intervene or not. 
Uh, the supernatural personal God is at the base of all phenomena. So what's the presupposition of the agnostic? God does not or cannot exist. And there you go. Does God exist? That's the key question. Settle that question, he said, and miracles cease to be a problem. And again, I'm coming back one last time to uh, J. Warner Wallace. He said he sat there and agonized about uh, the resurrection of Jesus. He had all these reasons why it seemed like it might have really happened, but on the other side of the page, under why it couldn't happen or wouldn't happen, he said because he didn't think miracles happen. Right? That was his presupposition, that this was a closed system. And he started thinking about it. He thought, I only have one issue that I'm dealing with, really. And if I can overcome that, I, I think all the evidence lies on the side of the resurrection. And so he realized that he could get past that if he really believed there was a God out there that could perform miracles. So anyway, this is a, a good book, Know Why You Believe. And um, I, I have uh, things on miracles. There are some excellent books on miracles. Lee Strobel's got one. Um, I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist deals with that. So uh, miracles are something that are being challenged in our skeptical world today. Well, thank you for joining me, and we'll do another podcast soon.